Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. So my objective today is twofold. First, to outline the reasons for what I would call our cautious optimism over the rest of this year. And secondly, to give you some idea of the process behind the investment decisions that we make on your behalf. So getting right down to it, I think the three biggest issues that currently concern us all as investors are, uh, number one, now that markets are at record highs, where do we go from here? Are the markets setting themselves up for a big fall, for a big dip like we saw last spring? Or will we continue to trend higher? Number two, what about inflation? Is the threat of inflation a real one? Is it coming back? Or is this just, as the Fed calls it, transitory? And number three, why has the Canadian dollar strengthened so much over the past year? And what impact is this having on your portfolios? So let's begin with a quick recap. A little over a year ago, we saw the fastest market collapse in history with the TSX and the S&P 500 losing one third of their value in just 33 days from Feb 20th. This was when the pandemic panic was just setting in. A little over a month after that, we saw all the major markets hit bottom together. And you can see that in the screen with all those lines converging on the March 23rd date. Um, and this was a start of what would turn out to be the quickest rebound on record. There has never been a faster rebound from a market low than this one. The catalyst for that upward move was expectation of massive US stimulus. And it, this just wasn't monetary stimulus from the Fed, but also fiscal stimulus in the form of a two trillion aid package. So as you can see, markets went up steadily from that point on. And although we had some choppiness in the run up to the US presidential election, the next major leg, up leg, started on November 9th. And that was the date when Pfizer and BioNTech announced the results from the vaccine trials that were simply phenomenal. Uh, I think better than a 90% success rate and I think unprecedented in the history of vaccines. So the prospect that life could return to normal sparked what is now known as the reopening trade. So basically investors began selling the tech giants and the other stocks, which were the biggest beneficiaries of the work from home phenomenon. And they started buying the stocks that had been hit the hardest by the pandemic, like airlines, cruise companies, restaurants, travel companies, and so on. So at this point in time, we have the TSX and the S&P 500 up about 10% year to date. And the S&P 500 in particular, it's almost doubled from its March 23rd low. So the TSX hit a record high just yesterday. So I think it's a good time to look at which sectors are leading the charge. As you can see from the panel on the left, the best performing sectors are what we call cyclical sectors because your performance is correlated with the economic cycle. As the economy improves, they do well. As the economy you know, goes down a little bit, they tend to retreat. So it stands to reason that at the present time, with the economy showing a great deal of strength and improving quite rapidly, sectors like energy, financials, and consumer discretionary, the top three, should do well. I've included a panel on the right to show you how the TSX has been changing over time. So for the longest time, the big three sectors on the TSX have been cyclical sectors, financials, energy, and materials. So these three, at the height of the commodity boom that ended in 2008, they made up 70 to 75% of the index, really, really dominant. 
but currently they count for only about 58%. Why is this a good thing? It means that we are reducing our traditional dependence on resources. You know, back in 1930, a Canadian economist named Harold Ennis, he used a phrase that comes from the Bible. He said Canada is a nation of hewers of wood and drawers of water. The good news is not anymore. Sectors like technology, industries, industrials, beg your pardon, and utilities now make up more than one quarter of the index. So the benefit of this is that as the TSX gets more diversified, you will have less ups and downs in the TSX in the index because of the diminishing influence of the cyclical sectors and return and in return, you'll also get more stable returns. Now let's look at where the economy is going from here. For clues in the market's future direction, we start by looking at growth prospects for the global economy. And this is especially relevant for Canada because we are a large exporter and hence really reliant on the global economy. Uh, the IMF publishes a report called the World Economic Outlook Report about once a quarter. And it gives us a really great snapshot of what the global growth is going to look like. So this year, as you can see from the panel on the left, the global economy is projected to grow by 6%. So that's quite a rebound, considering that it had contracted by 3.3% last year. And next year, it's going to slow down, which is to be expected, to a 4.4% pace. Now, what's also quite encouraging is that these estimates were all revised upward from the projections that the IMF made six months ago in October 2020. And the key reason for this improved outlook is the development and the rollout of the COVID vaccines. Now let's look at um, country specific projections. And let's compare the performance of the advanced economies versus the emerging markets, the two big blocks in the global economy. Uh, last year, the advanced economies like the US, UK, and most of Europe were hit much harder by the pand pandemic than emerging nations. But this year, the plight of countries like India and Brazil means that the situation has totally reversed. So the takeaway here is that while global growth will be solid, there's a lot of divergence across specific nations. For example, if you look at the table on the left, it shows that the US is expected to grow at a 6.4% pace this year, Canada at about 5%, and Europe at overall, Europe at 4.4%. But countries like Brazil, Japan, Nigeria expected to grow at a much slower pace. The damage caused by the pandemic and the slower rollout of vaccines in the developing nations also means that these IMF estimates for emerging, emerging nations in particular might be a little bit optimistic. For example, in this table, India was supposed to have the fastest growth this year at 12.5%. But given how badly it is being ravaged with the pandemic, I think that estimate will be revised down quite a bit. So the IMF report points out that we are not only seeing divergence across countries, but also across sectors. For example, tech and a few of the consumer staples tech sectors have done really well, but a lot of sectors like real estate have done really poorly, um, until recently that is. There's also been a disconnect between asset prices and the rest of the economy. But thankfully, that disconnect has narrowed quite a bit in recent months, thanks to the strength of the economy and the strength of the recovery, as the next few slides will show. So on this slide, we see that uh, earnings estimates for the TSX and the S&P 500 are both going up, and they've gone up quite nicely from the last one year. So basically, economic activity translates into corporate earnings, 
and over the long run, those profits are what drive stock prices. So in basic terms, the price for stock or an index like the TSX is driven by two factors, expected earnings per share and the multiple assigned to those earnings. Now that earnings multiple is also called the price earning or PE ratio, and it can vary quite widely. It can be as low as eight to 10 for a steady eddy, slow growth stock like a utility, or as much as 30 or higher for a fast growing stock like tech, for instance, or technology. Amazon, for example, trades at a PE of 58 times this year's forecast EPS. So if you look at the index earnings estimates for the TSX, earnings per share fell by 31% last year, but this year the forecast to surge by 64%. And that's a massive, massive turnaround. It's a similar story for the S&P 500. Last year, earnings for the S&P 500 only fell by about 14%. I say only because we were in the middle of a global pandemic, but in normal times, that would be quite a drop. But the reason it only fell by 14%, which is less than half the 31% decline of the TSX, is because the giant companies like Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they, huge, had, they made huge profits. And they collectively account for 35 to 40% of the S&P 500. So this year, S&P 500 profits Earnings per share are forecast to jump by 35%. Now, the panel on the right shows you how much earnings estimates have increased over the past year as the economic picture has improved. And it's no coincidence that the earnings picture has improved from quite a bit from de December onwards. The, the graph is upward sloping quite a bit. And that's precisely because vaccine optimism set in in earnest. So if you looked at, look at the projected earnings estimates for the TSX for this year, that's about 1165. Uh, it's trading currently at about 16.6 times, a PE multiple of 16.6 times this year's earnings. And for the S&P, it's about 22.3 times. Now bear in mind that the S&P, for a number of reasons, has historically traded at a pretty significant premium to the TSX. The takeaway from this is that although markets are at record highs, those market gains are being driven by extremely strong corporate earnings. These companies are making money like you wouldn't believe. Uh, in fact, for the S&P 500 companies, in the first quarter, they were estimated to have had a record operating profit margin of 12.8%. So the earnings picture is really robust. And as a result, not surprisingly, market strategists in both Canada and the US are uniformly bullish about the outlook. Uh, for the TSX, the average target is a little over 22,000 or oh, that's about 13% higher than the current TSX level. For the S&P 500, it's a little below 4,750, or 15% higher from here. Now, personally, I think those targets are a little bit ambitious, but it's quite possible that we could see the TSX trade over 20,000 in the next few months, and the S&P likewise approach 4,500 in the next few months. Um, if you add in the dividend yield for the TSX of about 2.7% and about 1.4% for the S&P 500, you get expected returns for Canadian and U.S. stocks over the next 6 to 12 months of the low to mid-teens, which is a pretty solid number. Now, one common concern that you know most investors have is Okay, great, we've had a really strong start to Q1, but what happens now? Are the markets going to fall? But research shows that this is not necessarily the case. You know, like they say, well begun is half done. So in the US, research shows that after first quarter gains of 5% to 10% in the last 70 years, 
13 out of 15 years were positive. Uh, for the TSX, Brian Belsky is a very well-known strategist at BMO. He notes that after Q1 gains of 25 to 10% in the last 35 years for the first quarter, 94% years of the years ended up in the green, or they were positive years. Uh, Belsky, in fact, is really bullish, and he thinks that we are squarely in the middle of a 20-year secular bull market that could go on for another 10 years. Um, you know, he's a pretty accurate forecaster, so I think uh, we need to pay a little bit of attention to what he's saying. So that's all the good news. Now let's turn to some of the risk factors that uh, you know have been a cause of for concern among a lot of investors. Uh, the first thing is inflation. You know, you might be thinking, what about inflation? Everything, the prices of everything seem to be going up. And that's quite true. We've had record prices for commodities like copper, iron ore, lumber. There's an acute shortage of semiconductor ships, chips, <laughs> beg your pardon. Uh, shipping costs are at multi-year highs and so on. So as a result, as you can see in the chart on the right, inflation expectations in the US are at the highest in a decade. And not surprisingly, bond yields have surged as a result. In April, US core CPI, which is you know, one of the main inflation indicators, and core simply means that it excludes food and energy costs because they jump around too much. So in April, US core CPI rose 0.9% from the month ago. And this was the biggest monthly jump since 1982. Um, core CPI also rose by 3% from a year ago. And this was the biggest increase since 1996. So quite naturally, the market freaked out quite a bit. But a major reason for the big jump in April inf inflation, it's what's called the base effect. What this means is that prices appear high compared to a year ago because they fell so much between March and May of last year. As well, if you look at the overall headline inflation number, of 0.8%. It was driven by transient components like used cars, car rentals, hotel costs, airfares, as more people began traveling in the US. So it's quite likely th that these are one-time jumps and they're not going to repeat themselves in the months ahead. But nevertheless, there's very little denying that inflation is quite strong. And today's inflation data in, the, in Canada showed a similar picture. Inflation rose 0.5% in April, and annual inflation came in at 3.4%. And a month ago, it was just 2.2%. So that's quite a jump. And this 3.4% annual inflation figure is the highest since 2011. Um, also note that most of the increase in this inflation was due to higher gas prices, which jumped 60% from a year ago, and also higher shelter costs. Core CPI, which means uh, CPI excluding food and energy costs in Canada, was 2.1% in April. So just above the 2% mark that worries central banks. Uh, and this was again the highest since 2012. Now, as you can see from the table out here, which shows 10 year government bond yields for Canada and the US. These have recovered from their lows last year to approach the levels from early 2020, just before the pandemic hit. So we are returning to more normal times. And one of the downsides of that is that bond yields are also approaching what should be normalized levels. And in fact, just over the past one year, uh, bond yields in both Canada and the US for the 10-year government bonds they've gone up by almost uh, one a full percentage point, 100 basis points. Now, one difference between previous recessions and the pandemic recession is that consumers' balance sheets are looking much better. And this is mainly because of generous government aid programs and the increase in asset prices like housing and stocks. 
Consumers also flush with cash because you know there was very little to spend on last year. No eating out, no vacations, no shopping, nothing. So the pent up demand in the in the economy is simply huge. It's phenomenal. The problem is, as demand ramps up, supply was curtailed during the pandemic. You know because factories were closed, people with COVID. You know as a result of that, so many things were closed. Production facilities were closed. You had that uh, weird um, traffic jam in the Suez Canal in the month of March. Uh, so the supply chain has been showing a lot of stress. And when you have this mismatch between demand that is surging and supply that has severe constraints, one potential byproduct is inflation. Many companies are concerned about this backup in the supply chain. And in fact, in the most recent earnings uh, conference calls for Q1, more than 200 companies said that inflation pressures were a major risk. So what are the central banks saying? The thing is, they don't really seem to be unduly worried by higher inflation. Uh, the Bank of Canada expects inflation to rise temporarily to about 3% and then decline towards 2%, a level that they're quite comfortable with. What's really interesting is the stance of the US Federal Reserve. The Fed is targeting average inflation of 2%. And this is the first time a lot of economists have heard about it that a central bank is targeting average inflation. So this means that because inflation has been below 2% for the longest time, they might be prepared to let it run at 3% for a period of time. The big debate in the market is, you know, is inflation going to reach 3% stay there and move higher? Or is it going to come back like the Fed expects? Both central banks have said, that they do not expect to raise interest rates for quite some time. So this would be the second half of next year for the Bank of Canada. And for the Fed, they don't expect to raise rates before 2023. The implication here is that they really think that current inflation pressures are transitory. But whether investors agree with this assessment is a different story. Now, the thing is that Experienced investors know that it is sheer folly to do what's called fight the Fed, which means, you know, you're better off uh, going along with the, what the Fed is signaling than trying to take a contrarian stance and go against, uh, you know, the Fed's views. What we are doing at Love Financial is that, is that we are watching the inflation picture quite closely. We're not taking an inflexible view. Uh, we are not panicking, but we are watching the inflation picture to see, you know, what shakes out and what positioning we should adopt in our stocks and bonds portfolio. The thing is, some inflation is actually good for stocks because companies with pricing power now have an excuse to raise prices, and we've seen that. Uh, that's bad news for consumers, but you know, reasonably good news for investors and really good news for corporate profits. We turn now to the Canadian dollar, another subject that has been uh, you know, on people's minds for a few months now. The CAD is among the best performing currencies against the US dollar. It's up about 5% year to date and up about 20% from its March 2020 low, which was just below 70 cents, I think 68 or 69 cents. Uh, why is the Canadian dollar up so much? Well, one thing is it's benefiting from sharply higher prices from commodities for commodities and for crude oil. It's also benefiting from what's called the yield spread between Canadian and U.S. bonds. So that was quite wide back six to nine months ago. That spread is now only 11 basis points. That benefits the Canadian dollar as well. Um, but it does look like the CAD's appreciation is causing some concern. And this last week, uh, Bank of Canada Governor 
Tiff Macklin said that further gains could be an economic headwind and you know, it might have some impact on monetary policy. Now, in my opinion, I think there are some reasons to think that CAD might top out between 85 and 87 US cents, or that works out to 1.15 to 1.18, compared to today's level of 1.2130. Uh, why do you think so? Well, first of all, Canada has a lower proportion of the population uh, vaccinated compared to the US. We've caught up quite a bit over the last couple of months, but still, by all, all indications are that the, the US economy is opening up much faster than Canada's. We now have more COVID cases per capita. Um, and most important, COVID is still rampant in many, many nations around the world. So this could affect global growth and commodity prices. And in fact, we did see a big sell off uh, in commodity prices today. Lumber collapsed, crude oil prices fell down, and the Canadian dollar also retreated as a result. Putting it all together, here are two graphs that summarize the tussle between the positive and the negative in the markets. So the panel on the left shows a really good earnings story. It shows that the companies in the S&P 500 have exceeded earnings estimates for the first quarter. Uh, more companies have exceeded these earnings estimates than in the last 30 years. So it confirms that earnings growth is extremely strong. The bad news is on the panel on the right, which shows that stocks and bonds are moving in tandem by most in over two decades. Uh, why is this a problem? It's because ideally we like them to have a negative correlation so that when stocks fall, you know, money gravitates to stuff that is safer like bonds and bonds rise. This enables us to sell bonds and buy stocks when the markets crash which is what we did on a number of occasions last March and throughout last year, as a matter of fact. But when stocks and bonds move together, it's a little harder to do the rebalancing. The money has got to come from somewhere. And they typically move together when, when inflation is a concern. So not something that we are very worried about right now, but surely something that we are watching. So in conclusion, uh, we think the global economy, or at least major parts of it, are on track to return to more normal times in the second half of this year. Thank goodness. Uh, the market rally is based on strong fundamentals. It's not based on weak fundamentals or you know stuff that cannot be justified. And those strong fundamentals are predominantly the big, the huge rebound in earnings from last year's plunge. Um, with equities looking like they could generate total returns of 10 to 15 percent over the next 12 months, that's certainly the place to be. Uh, bonds, bonds might be bond prices might be under some pressure for some time as yields continue to back up. You know, cash pays next to nothing, so equities by default are the place to be. Cyclical stocks also back in favor, and that's a great thing for us. We think it benefits the TSX a lot. It benefits our portfolios. Uh, now, mind you, our portfolios have a really good mix of growth and value stocks, but seeing the value stocks come back so strongly, it turbocharges our portfolios. On the risk side, the stronger CAD is a bit of a risk because it eats into our portfolio returns. But honestly, we're quite comfortable with this risk. Our preference is to leave our US dollar exposure unhedged because it provide, provides a great cushion when markets get tumble and the US dollar strengthens and the CAD drops. That's precisely what we saw today. Uh, markets came back quite strongly by the end of the day, but early in the day, they were down one, one and a half percent uh, and the Canadian dollar tumbled as well. So it really cushions, provides a great um, downside mitigation measure, which is why we prefer to leave our CAD exposure unhinged. And finally, you may have heard of this seasonal trend called sell in May and go away, which refers to staying out of the market for the, from the May to November period. You know, it, that's fine in theory, but in practice, it's quite difficult to do it. Uh, the thing is, it used to work in the past quite nicely, 
has not worked for the last five years. And we honestly doubt it will work this year because we've seen, uh, you know, we have seen more market ups and downs, more volatility this month. But given the strength of the economic rebound and the fact that people are looking forward to better times, there may be little justification for the sell in May and go away phenomenon this year. So overall, we think your portfolios are really well positioned with a good balance of growth, cyclical and defensive securities. Uh, these will perform well if the markets continue to go up. But if we do see a dip, uh, we've got good downside protection and rest assured we'll be going in and, and buying that dip. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Thank you very much for your time and your for your patience. Thank you for being valued clients of Love Financial. And I'm here to answer any questions. You know, obviously, uh, we get a lot of questions around the Canadian dollar. Um, what do you, with, with the Canadian dollar up so substantially over the past 12 months, you know, um, rising 15%, year over year versus the, the U.S. dollar. How do we protect clients from or hedge that exposure to uh, a rising Canadian dollar in our diversified portfolios, knowing that we hold a substantial amount of their assets uh, directly in U.S. companies? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we would be really reluctant to take down our overall USD exposure to, let's say, below 10%. So 20 to 25% is the top end of the range. Uh, in terms of hedging that risk, one way to do it would be by switching from um, unhedged products like the EQL ETF that a lot of clients hold into the hedged version. That accounts for 2.5% of our balanced portfolio. So that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way to do it would be to just uh, reduce our USG exposure um, on a broad level. For instance, in our large balanced portfolios, we hold uh, an excellent ETF called the XLG, which, is, which contains the top 50 USG companies. If we think that the prospects for the Canadian economy are going to improve compared to the US, then we would probably trim XLG a little bit. The point I'm trying to make is that we, we probably have a swing factor of five, seven and a half percent. But given how far the CAD has come, uh, you know, I don't think anyone sees it at parity in the next couple of years because this is more like a inventory rebuilding rather than a new commodity super cycle. And that being the case, if CAD's going to top out at about 85, 90 cents, we're quite happy to run the risk of it. Uh, you know, going up a little bit. You know, I think that's that's a good point, Alyssa. And I know at our portfolio manager meetings that we hold every Monday, um, this has been a source of great debate uh, amongst the team because quite often a knee-jerk reaction can result in having uh, uh, apocalyptic long-term effects. So one of the things people tend to react to, I've found after 22 years of doing this is, when the CAD goes into the toilet, everybody thinks and all the media puts out that it's going to happen, it's going to go further. So when we were hovering around that 68, 70 cents, you know, there's a lot of headlines talking about our petrodollar going to 50 cents as the price of oil went through the floor. And look what happened, right? It, we rallied today to say 82 and a half. But uh, if you go back almost precisely six years to today, the dollar was at 82 and a half. So it's one of the most dangerous things. My response to that question is it's one of the most dangerous things to try to time and call mm -hmm. and to get your hedging correct. A lot of portfolio managers refuse to do it. As you saw in Elvis's presentation, a lot of these major companies that we continue to hold in the S&P 500, um, these large blue chip, uh, you know, positive earnings generating behemoths are centered in the United States. And, you know, if we own them for over the longer term, we'll do fine. Um, another question, Elvis, then, is, uh, it was also mirrored by a couple of our attendees today, is, you know, we talked about correlation. And correlation, for those of you who don't know or 
didn't quite catch that. It's just a fancy word for things moving together. If they're positively correlated, they go up and down at the same time. If they're negatively correlated, something goes up, something else drops. So when Elvis, when you talk about um, stocks and bonds, all of a sudden moving in tandem, being positively correlated, one of the questions we got was, well, if, if my diversified portfolio is stocks and bonds and bond prices are going down and with expectations of rising yields and stock prices are going down with expectations of inflationary pressures, well, how are you protecting my money? Yeah, good question again. Um, just a little bit of a backdrop here. Um, the thing is, you know, bonds have been in a tremendous bull market from 1982 right until the time the just before the pandemic hit maybe a couple of years before that um, you know interest rates were going down relentlessly bond yields were going down all the time bond prices were going up this is a perfect backdrop for stock gains which is why you saw those phenomenal market gains in the 1990s in the first decade of this millennium before the financial crisis and again in the last decade Things may have changed now, you know, and just as when yields keep going down, it's really positive for stocks and bonds. You're now seeing the reverse of the picture. The question is, you know, is this here to stay? And everyone is grappling with that particular question. But one potential solution is by adding alternative investments to our portfolios, which we've been doing we started with the largest clients and now we spread that across all our clients, big and small. Uh, these alts, whether they're mortgage investment corporations, you know, real estate, private REITs, uh, private debt, private equity, they tend to not be correlated with stocks and bonds and they, they have the advantage of stable cash flows. So they work really, really well in an environment where uh, we are not certain about how high yields will go. So would you say that as, as a, in general, we've reduced uh, some of our exposure to the, some of these more traditional asset classes? That is correct. Um, when you say alternatives, you don't mean that they had uh, spiky punk rock hair and goth uh, makeup on. You know, this is a terminology that's very that's new. That's only on the weekends, Robert. Huh? That's only on the weekends. That's right. <laughs> When you're playing drums, which I know you do. Um, so, no, this is also a new terminology. I mean, 20 years ago, you never heard this term, alternatives. It's very much a marketing thing for a lot of these companies that are trying to produce these products. But we at La Financial, as a team, we were early in uh, to get some what we call non-correlated assets into your portfolios. And probably chief amongst those that we were – one of the earliest holders of in the in the city, especially from a retail investment perspective, in other words, giving it to clients that aren't institutions like pension plans, was our allocation to mortgages. So um, this has been the most stable part, if not a little sleepy and boring. But the Antrim mortgage portfolio is a big portion of all of most of our clients' accounts and pays a very stable cash flow yield and rates will go up. But some of the other things, Elvis, that we have, what about like floating rates in our bond portfolio? So, you know, these are, are senior loans quite often where the interest rates are, are uh, allowed to, as the terminology goes, float. So in a rising interest rate environment, we actually get uh, resetting at a higher point. Uh, other alternatives that people don't have quite often, but um, we've had exposure to for a long time are preferred shares. So preferred shares have benefited uh, very heavily in this uh, environment in the short term. Mm -hmm. um, so we've protected, you know, your traditional, I think the old traditional, you know, forgive me for the cliche, Elvis, but the old 60-40 is dead, right? Like the idea of just a, a normal portfolio that'd be 20% U.S., 20% Canada, 20% international, and then a 40% bond component, um, your portfolios here that we manage for you as clients are not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that a big portion of, think of it, I think the way to think about it is there are stocks, there are bonds, but we've got the income portion of your portfolio has got more than just a bond component. As I said, real estate, mortgages, alternative forms of debt, um, things to protect you. Okay, good. Um, 
some of the other ones we're getting, I uh, saw something about, uh, do you dare, do we dare talk about the Canadian sacred cow? Questions we're getting uh, is, uh, you know, with the hot housing market, mm -hmm. um, what do you, what do we think? Uh, what do we think? Would we add home builders or what do you think of real estate or real estate stocks in general, Elvis? Um, it's interesting. It, it, you know, when you talk about real estate, it's uh, really, uh, everyone seems to think about residential real estate, right? That's like wired into our consciousness. Uh, but the real opportunity, at least on the investment side, seems to be on the on the commercial side. And as an example, one of the uh, ETFs we hold is uh, RIT, uh, you know, which holds a really good mix of commercial properties across the country. Uh, so as the economy reopens, we are seeing you know interest in REITs come back. Now, when it comes to residential housing, I don't know. It, it really seems like, uh, you know, to me, that probably is a really big risk factor for the Canadian economy. Uh, a fidelity economist, a well-known guy recently said that the contribution of housing, of Canadian housing to GDP is now over 9%. And that's been the danger mark in previous, uh, in places that where housing fell off a cliff. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But certainly something that we need to be really cognizant about. You know, housing could pose a risk because the madness we're seeing with people bidding, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands over asking, you know, it's got to stop somewhere. Right. Smart and safe answer. Never never try to forecast the uh, Canadian <laughs> residential real estate market. I would just echo that and say that the big, biggest impetus here has been a a low interest rate environment. And when you look at that consistently decreasing bond yields that we've had, um, going back, if you do a 25 year chart of Canadian 10 year bonds, or even the five year bonds where most of these mortgages are sourced uh, and the chart is down, um, just ask yourself this or ask people that you know this that are borrowing money. Uh, if you can't afford that mortgage at double the prevailing rate, and realize that for every 100 basis point increase in the cost of that debt to you, the factor of your cash flow goes up by 11%. So in other words, if, if you reset your mortgage uh, from 2.5% to 5.5%, the cost of carrying that debt's gonna go up 33%. Are we gonna see 33% wage price inflation over the next 60 months? Probably not. Yeah. Could, we, could we see a 300 basis point rise in uh, the short-term bond yields, absolutely. So the one of the things you know, the, what, you know, you're asking Mike uh, Donny has a question about, um, you know, the governments seem opti optimistic inflation will stay low. I actually don't agree with that. What the governments are telling you is that they're going to allow inflation expectations to slowly rise. The only way a lot of these central banks can get out of this mess of monetary printing is to deflate the value of the debt they have on their balance sheets. And the only way you make your debt less valuable is if there is inflation. So you inflate away the value of your debt because you can't raise taxes. You can't raise personal taxes in BC past this 53.5% marginal rate. So there will be, we know there's inflation. We yeah. all know that real inflation we're feeling is not 200 basis points. Like you say, like you go down there, you know, you're in the States and every, he's lucky he's down there right now, but everywhere you go, the restaurants are busy. Somebody was talking about on our chat that commodities and lumber prices have tripled. We know there's inflation. So how much they're going to let us experience, this is the, this is the unknown. Yeah. Uh, Renee wants to know, we'll have a couple more questions here. We're getting near the end of our time, a few more, two more minutes, but uh, Bitcoin, <laughs> anybody want to tackle that one? Dog coin, come on. Uh, so, uh, I have an ongoing debate with my sons about the merits or demerits of investing in Bitcoin and Dogecoin and so on. I just think that, you know, uh, what's happened today is yet more proof that uh, as long as these cryptocurrencies stay so volatile, they are not going, they're not going to find mainstream application. I'll give an example. The Canadian dollar today closed at 82.5 82 cents, US cents. So Bitcoin had a 20 or 30% swing just today. What this means is that, uh, you know, if, if 
if a cad experience the same volatility you could have seen the price anywhere from 68 cents to parity with the us dollar in this in, a, in in one day you know how is that ever going to work so i just say that we we do get questions on cryptocurrencies and i was aware of it uh, of bitcoin when it was at 30 bucks i regret not buying it at that point but at 50000 or 30000 it's a little too late in the game you know i know that uh, the arc uh, staff fund manager kathy wood she thinks bitcoin is going to go to a million bucks all i can say is you know everyone has a view on it but what we do here at love financial is serious money if you have a strong view on cryptocurrency you know you want to take a flyer with a thousand or two thousand bucks sure go go for it that's but, what i would suggest too it doesn't yeah, belong it doesn't, it doesn't belong in your your serious money right it's pay money sorry yeah yeah agreed 100% it's one of those things if this is if you're going to take you know 1% of your money that you were willing to lose um and gamble because this is what it is it's a speculative investment there is clearly no floor and you have to remember the the technology behind it is what will become more interesting central banks around the world still want to control uh the source of money so there's a lot of Uh, application going forward for how central banks will have their own cryptos, and then what's going to happen to things like Bitcoin or Dog Dodge Coin or however you want to say it. Yeah. Um, we probably are not going to see those in in our portfolios anytime soon, but um, you know that's that's just too speculative for us. Um, gold. What's our exposure to gold? I'll just care to explain that to people. Um, the main gold exposure we have is possibly in some of the mutual funds that we hold. We also have we also own Barrick Gold, and we're not selling it anytime soon. Uh, I think if anything, uh, we'll keep buying it on the dips. And I think companies like uh, Barrick Gold have tremendous exposure to the uh, price of gold. You know, much better than buying the underlying commodity unless you want to make jewelry out of it. Uh, but with Barrick Gold, I could see it going to forty-five, fifty bucks over the next two or three years. um i think in this situation where inflation is beginning to uh, show serious signs of uh, being a problem gold could do really well mm-hmm. like gold we possibly could potentially increase the exposure to it a little bit um last maybe last couple of questions here mr mccaffrey was asking how the enormous federal debt is going to infect uh, affect who oh, slim mm-hmm. there infect our portfolio or investments the economy so wh- how are we protecting people from uh obviously this debt is inflationary and so it's it's that same feedback loop what do you uh, what is your stance on that obviously? yeah i think if you if you have moderate inflation it's it's not a bad thing like i mentioned uh, a lot of the companies that we own you know market leaders in the space they have the pricing power to increase prices uh so that translates into higher corporate earnings higher stock prices a little bit of inflation is also good for housing prices um in terms of the enormous level of federal debt uh you know this this has been a subject for debate from the last ever since the great financial crisis for the last 12 13 years and i think when the pandemic hit it was such a it was such a once in a century event that central banks threw caution to the wind because they had to do whatever they could to st- to stem the damage and get the economies going again um i think all all the central banks what they hope to do is kick the can down the road that's the only solution you know how are they going to uh, if inflation starts becoming a problem is that going to force their hand and make them raise rates faster than they expected and if that's if that's going to happen what's going to happen to the housing market in the us and canada it will collapse so it's a balancing act it's it's uh, something they've been playing for the last 15 years and i think at the end of the day all they will continue to do is kick the can down the road and you know just finagle their way to 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 do whatever they can to keep the economy going i mean one 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 uh, unexpected outcome or i should say a negative outcome of this whole of keeping rates so low is that you've seen massive asset inflation with its housing prices stock prices cryptocurrencies you know that bubble could burst but central banks are going to be very very wary of raising rates before the market expects it 
So it's not, the, the no, key, it's, no, it's, it's, it is good because we don't really have a definitive answer, but you know, I don't know how many investors out there know who Ray Dalio is. Uh, Bridgewater Associates manages, you know, hundred billion dollars. Uh, so a lot, but he put it really simply in one of his last writings. He says, you know, again, the only way for these central banks to get out of this massive debt and monetary stimulus is, is inflation. Yeah. Right? So, so say it's not a problem visually, but allow it to creep into our lives. So how do you protect yourself? You have to own assets. So we are going to see in more inflation in things like real estate, um, in, in things like the assets you own in your portfolio and the key to protect yourself from volatility is to remain diversified. So if you, the, the killer will be stagnant wages or fixed wages and or in inordinate amounts of cash or too much of your money in one asset class. So this is how we help protect you is to make sure that your portfolios here are very well diversified and we own things that can pass on that inflation in increasing their prices and thus their earnings. So just to add on to that, uh, like Robert mentioned, the 60-40 model is not, no longer working as well as it used to. So what this means is uh, if inflation becomes a problem, you own physical assets. That means that at, at our firm, we also tweak asset allocation. So we probably might go 65, 70% equities, maybe yeah. 5, 10% uh, alternative assets, and maybe the rest fixed income. But in that kind of scenario, where rates or interest rates or yields are going up, you certainly want to bring your fixed in income allocation down a little bit. Exactly. Um, thanks, Elvis. This has been excellent. Uh, last question we'll answer for everybody is that we are going to post this webinar uh, replay of it on our website. So you'll be able to go through that. I encourage you to reach out to your uh, lead advisor or any, or Elvis or any of us for that matter with any questions. Um, Aaron has put together a great survey that you'll be getting after this. Uh, to let us know what you found interesting, what we can improve upon. I expect one of these probably every month going forward, we're going to have different topics. So we are asking in the, uh, in the questionnaire, you know, what topics of interest you would have. Um, and I hope you guys, I hope everybody here found that uh, beneficial. I know I did Elvis. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thanks to uh, John and, and Ryan and Aaron for, for all of us being here at the same time.